Welcome to the physics section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 6 to 10. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Now we can go through the questions together. In question six, it says two identical cars, one traveling at 26 miles per hour and the other at 78 miles per hour, skid to a stop. How much longer is the skid mark produced by the faster moving car, assuming the skid mark begins forming immediately when the car begins decelerating and once the car is station and it ends once the car is stationary. So we have two identical cars. So note that they're identical, which means their mass is going to be the same. Their force of friction against the ground is going to be the same as well. One is traveling at this speed, the other is at a different speed, and they're skidding. And we want to know the skid mark. How much longer is a skid mark by the faster moving car? So the speed at which they're traveling is some kinetic energy, which we can get from half mv squared. And then to bring the car to a stop, we need to apply some work, which means we have a force times a distance. In this case, our force is friction. So some force of friction is going to be pulling against the movement of the car, and then it's going to occur over some distance. That distance is the skid mark. And for the two cars, their mass is the same. Really, the only thing which differs is their velocity. Also, their force of friction, because they're identical cars, is going to be the same as well. So the key thing that we care about is distance. And so the way that we can find this is simply by taking the ratio of the two. If we did this equation for one car over the same equation for another car, we can get half mv, well, I can just, yeah, okay. Half mv squared equals so the bottom one is for the second car. So the top one will be for the faster car because we want to know how much longer the skid mark is for the faster car. Bottom one is for the slower car. And then we can see that these things cancel out. The half cancels out. The mass also cancels out. So all we have left is velocity squared over velocity squared equals distance over distance. So the ratio of the velocities is going to be the same as the ratio of the distances. So let's look at our velocities that we got, 26 and 78. So we have... 78 squared over 26 squared and then this is just like let's say distance 1 over distance 2 and when you calculate this ratio you see that the top one is a magnitude of 9 greater than the bottom one therefore like the top car is traveling nine times faster than the bottom car, the, and therefore it takes that much longer for the faster car to come to a stop, and that's how much longer the skid mark is. So it's going to be nine times longer. So D is our correct answer. In question seven, it says a lead sphere with a volume of one milliliters and a silicon sphere with a volume of also one milliliter are dropped into water. What is the buoyant force on each sphere? Note the density of lead is 11 grams per milliliter and the density of silicon is 2.3. So we have a lead sphere with this volume and we have a silicon sphere with this volume and they're dropped into water. That is our liquid that we're in. We're also given the density of lead and then density of silicon as well. But for this question, you should know that that is misleading because you don't need the density of these objects. The buoyant force is simply the amount of the amount of water, the weight of water that an object has displaced. That is going to be equal to the weight of the force that the water pushes up against the object. And so the force of the buoyant buoyancy force is going to be the density of the liquid times the volume of the object times g, which is gravity. So in this case, we have water. So density is one gram per liter. 
our volume for both objects was one milliliter. Therefore, we can write 0 0.001 liter. Gravity, let's just say it's 10 meters per second squared. And that ends up equaling 0 0.01 newtons. So D is our correct answer. The buoyant force on both of them is going to be the same. It doesn't differ because the buoyant force is once again dependent on the weight of water displaced by an object. And the density that we care about in this equation is the density of the liquid, not the density of the objects. And then all that matters now is the weight of the buoyant force and then how it relates to the weight of the object. If water is pushing with some buoyant force against the object, but the object is still heavier, it's going to sink. But if it's lighter, it's going to float. That's all that matters. But the buoyant force for these objects, because of their volume, is the same. In question 8, it states the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that there is a limit to measuring the precision of which properties of quantum particles. So we're talking about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the definition for this is that you cannot know precisely both the momentum and the position of an object when we're talking on the quantum scale. So it's talking about momentum and position and not diameter. Diameter is not really relevant to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So one and three, C is our correct answer. In question nine, it states a five kilogram mass is tied to the end of a one meter string which is spun in circles of 60 rotations per minute. What change in tension of the string would be expected if the string is then spun at 120 rotations per minute? So we have this mass, five kilograms, it's at the end of a one meter string that is spinning in circles, and then it has 60 rotations per minute. We now double it to 20, 120 rotations per minute. So we wanna know the change in tension. That's what we're looking for. Well, when we're talking about an object spinning around and it's held by a string, we're talking about the centripetal force. So the equation for that is A is equal to mv squared over R. So centripetal force is just talking about a force that is responsible for keeping an object in circular motion. In this case, when we're spinning something around in the string, it's the tension of the string, which is holding the object in place and allowing it to spin in circles. Therefore, tension is the same as our centripetal force. So we just look at the equation for centripetal force. We're not going to be changing the mass or the radius. All we're changing is the rotation, so the speed. So v square is changing. We have doubled it, but we see that in the equation, it's, it has an exponent of 2. That's its relationship in the equation. Therefore, if we double the speed, the overall centripetal force is going to be multiply by four, and then therefore we can also say the change in tension is going to increase fourfold. So B is our correct answer here. In question 10, it says the buoyant force of a sunken ship, a buoyant force on a sunken ship of a block of iron is equal to blank. So in this question, we're not talking about the sunken ship. We're just saying there's a sunken ship and on top of it, there's a block of iron. For the block of iron, so the buoyant force on the block of iron is equal to what? Well, buoyant force is equal to the weight of water that an object displaces. That's the same force at which the water is going to push against the object. So for example, we can have three objects, one made of, let's say cork, like we have three balls. One is made of cork, one is made of aluminum, one is made of lead. If they all have the same volume, they're displacing the same amount of water. If we dip them a little bit under the water, they're displacing the same amount of water. Therefore, the weight is the same, and the force, that's the buoyant force, is the same against all three, but then it depends on their actual weight. So the cork is lighter than the force of water, therefore it will go up and float. Aluminium will sink, and then the lead is even heavier, so it will sink more. So buoyant force, always dependent on the weight of water that an object displaces. So it's not, the weight of the iron block, A is incorrect, B is correct. It's the weight of water displaced by the iron block. Option C is saying the weight of the pressure difference between the surface of the water and the center of mass of the block, no. 
it's not about pressure differences or like the center mass it's just about weight of difference uh, sorry weight of water displaced and option d is saying the weight of water below the iron block no it's not about how much water is below you it's how much by sinking into a body of liquid how much liquid have you displaced so D is also incorrect. B is the correct answer here. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot more questions just like we did in this video, going through all the answer options, explaining why each one is correct or incorrect. And that's it for this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel as well to keep up to date with the videos that we post here. And I'll see you guys in the next video.